you don't want to sacrifice your best years, you know, just to achieve retirement at a certain age. So I think the fire movement comes out of that and that, you know, they have a better sense of seeing what maybe our parents' generation did and, and wanting to try a different path. Welcome to Personal Finance Cat, where I share my personal take on personal finance. Hi, TJ. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Great, great. So you are a financial planner and it seems like you focus on the millennial generation. Is it fair to say that you are a millennial yourself? Yeah, that's correct. I'm definitely a millennial. And uh, yeah, started my financial planning practice back in 2018, you know, mm -hmm. focusing on serving millennials. And uh, yeah, it's been quite the journey. First question I have for you. There are a lot of financial planners out there. What do you think distinguish your service from the others? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think I'll just start with like the financial advisory industry at large. I think that, you know, financial advisors have a, a bad name historically and, and for fair reason, um, you know, a large portion of the industry, um, you know, call themselves advisors, but really they're selling like financial products and they're really like product salespeople and they're not necessarily like, providing advice in people's best interests. So I think that, you know, the new generation of advisors and planners, you know, are really starting to change the overall industry. So I think there's a lot of great financial planners out there, especially in the independent space, um, who are being transparent with how they're charging fees and the services that they're providing. And so, you know, I just try to structure my practice kind of how I would want to be served and basically, you know, built it out that way. So it was very transparent, straightforward. And, you know, just like any other profession, like you pay a fee for, for the service and then, um, and then over time, you start to kind of niche down and focus more on a particular, you know, type of client that you can add the best value to. So I think a lot of the best advisors really focus on just a specific type of person and a specific type of problem that they're trying to solve. That makes a lot of sense. And what made you interested in becoming a financial planner? And what was your background before founding your own company? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I definitely talked a lot about money with my dad growing up. You know, he was uh, one of six and um, his dad unfortunately passed away when he was a, with a baby. They were Dutch immigrants. And so, you know, money was very scarce for him and that carried over a lot into his adult life. And so he just always talked to me about money. And uh, I was always trying to figure out, you know, how do you properly, you know, kind of manage money? And so I went down this, you know, uh, path just education. I studied economics and actuarial science in college. So I was always into, you know, math and statistics and uh, just kind of basically my senior year of college decided that, um, you know, wanted to figure out what I was going to do. And I had this, again, interest in more of the investing side. I didn't really know much about personal finance, uh, but I ended up, you know, doing an internship, um, worked for Ameriprise, which is kind of a big, um, you know, financial planning wealth management company. And got all of my licenses, CFP designation, and basically just um, went at it, you know, pretty quickly out of college, and then decided that I wanted to take a take a stab at it myself for for starting my own practice. Gotcha. How long were you with that company before you opened up your own shop? Yeah, so I graduated college in 2015, okay. and I worked uh, for about like two and a half years for Ameriprise. So it was really quick. Um, pretty much did it as quick as anybody could do it. I, I used to have a little bit of like, um, I don't know what the word is, but you know, obviously like imposter syndrome about not having like a ton of experience. Um, but, you know, basically, you know, worked for that company for two and a half years, got my series seven, series 66 insurance license. I ended up moving back to Massachusetts in 2018. I did work for another independent firm for about a year before I took the leap on my own. So did it pretty much as quick as you can. And, um, you know, Probably could have used a little bit more experience, but learned a lot on the fly as well. Yeah, I'm sure. And I was looking at your website. It seems that you offer quite a wide range of, I guess, planning or advisory services um, from maybe tax advice to personal finance aspects. How did you accumulate all that knowledge to be able to advise for people? Yeah, so I was lucky to, again, work for a really good advisor out of college, and she um, was very focused on financial planning, which I thought was great because you don't always see that in the in the bigger corporations. So I got to sit on, on kind of like higher net worth, um, you know, conversations as far as like what were the planning topics they were discussing, how are they creating investment strategies, how are they dealing with tax planning. So I saw a lot of that stuff at the higher net worth level, and I just thought, you know, there's nothing that they're receiving that you can't provide at little at like lower levels. And I also wanted to work with people 
earlier in their careers because you can have more of an impact on the trajectory. You know, somebody that doesn't save, you know, for 30 years and all of a sudden they're, they want to retire, there's not much you can do there, but there's things you can do earlier on. Um, so when it comes to the actual like technical knowledge, it just, I'm always somebody who's been a lifelong learner. Um, so I, I don't invest in my ongoing education. Uh, if you're not familiar with like Michael Kitsis, like being a member of his groups and, and really keeping up to date with all the financial planning, um, you know, technical knowledge there. But really a lot of it is, you know, learned on the fly, uh, especially from a tax planning standpoint that is always evolving. Um, luckily there's a lot of really great third party tools that can help aid advisors and understanding, you know, for example, like reading someone's tax return and identifying things like, you know, any errors or missed opportunities. And then, um, you know, I got into a focus on equity compensation. So people that receive stock from their employer. And so, you know, there's the planning aspect of things as far as like what you want to do with the money and, you know, maybe how much concentration you have, meaning how much you own of that company. But then there's also the, the tax planning decisions that can have big consequences and basically it's just leaning on advisors in your community and, and learning as you go through case studies. Interesting. I think you mentioned that, you know, you kind of gradually niched down since you started. And I was also looking on your website. It seems like you have a certain profile of the type of customers that you probably would add the most value to. Can yes. you talk about that a bit and how did you kind of niche down through time? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so I came up through, if you're familiar with XY Planning Network, I'm not sure if you are, but Michael Kitsis is one of the co-founders who I mentioned earlier, um, right. who I would say is like the leader in the financial planning space. Uh, but basically, basically XY Planning Network made it so that it was providing the technology and resources to be able to serve those Gen X and Gen Y, so like millennials and Gen X, who um, currently aren't really being targeted by the overall financial advisor uh, industry just because most of the industry is going after the retirees with a million or more of investable assets, which is, which is a very small percentage of the population. And so, um, you know, by working with millennials, there's a lot more opportunity, but also, you know, they don't necessarily have the means to justify paying higher fees. Um, so I would say it started off, you know, I had very low, uh, you know, fixed retainer fees. And then over time, I just basically figured out the people that I could add the most value to. And those were the situations where it was people who had equity compensation. So a lot of times they had stock options in um, like a startup type company where they are trying to figure out um, they'd heard about things like alternative minimum tax, where if you exercise too many options, you can get hit with this phantom tax, which can really cause a cash flow problem for you. Um, so basically as I identified more of these problems or pain points, I started niching down to focus on like, here's the initial thing that's bringing people in. And then from there, that transitions into kind of like a traditional planning and wealth management relationship. So it was really just identifying like, who are the people I can have, add the most value for? Here's their typical profile. And then um, kind of sticking to that moving forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you mentioned equity comp a couple of times, and it sounds like maybe there are some common strategies that can be used to best take advantage of that sort of compensation. Can you talk about maybe some of the, on a high level, some of the strategies that you would advise the clients to take? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it depends on a couple of different things. So again, if you're working for more of a startup or younger company, you're probably getting a lot of stock options. Um, the, the main form of options that we see is like incentive stock options versus just restricted stock, meaning they're just giving you shares. You have a vesting schedule over time, meaning that um, you have to work for the company for a certain amount of time and those shares will be released to you. And so, you know, if you're just getting stock from your company, it's a little bit more uh, developed. Maybe it's a publicly traded company. Then that's just really just focusing on your concentration risk. What is concentration risk? That just means how much of your investable assets are you comfortable owning in an individual stock? In those cases, a lot of times people will not, you know, be mindful of their strategy for if they're going to do anything with it. They'll just either accumulate it or they won't even think about, you know, how much additional stock do I have that I haven't received yet, but I'm set to receive. And, you know, what can happen is you can, again, uh, there's times where you can have 50 plus percent of your overall net worth tied to the performance of an individual stock. And so, 
that's fine if it's a conscious decision. But a lot of times people, you know, can have a little bit of uh, overconfidence in the performance of their company because they work there. And that's that that makes sense. But a lot of times, you know, um, history has shown and I've seen time and time again that, you know, individual companies, you know, uh, can have massive drawdowns. And at some point you do want to consider kind of locking in that path to your long term financial independence if you care about that. Um, and so really it's just educating people on that concentration risk if it's just restricted stock. If it's incentive stock options, because um, again, you're working in more of a startup, then that is a bit more complicated. There's some strategies there as far as like when you exercise your options, uh, if you want to be mindful of tax planning opportunities. Um, I mentioned alternative minimum tax. That's something that can come into play when you exercise options. Um, the reason why you may want to exercise your options earlier is if you are, you know, bullish on your company and you, you know, want to benefit from the growth of it, you can start to get the clock ticking on long-term capital gains treatment, which is your tax at a lower rate than your normal income tax rate. And so that can be a very powerful strategy for being tax efficient if you do anticipate that your company stock is going to continue, continue to increase in value. Gotcha. Can you talk about the alternative minimum tax? Uh, what does that mean and why that might be a potential pitfall for some people? Yeah. It, now, I will say AMT is kind of like it doesn't really impact that many people. Like if you look statistically at what percentage of taxpayers um, get hit with AMT. But basically, there are two different tax codes. There's the regular tax code and then there's the alternative minimum tax code. And what they do is that they compare these two tax codes and with exercising options, the difference between your exercise price and the share price, that that difference there is considered, they call it like a preference item where they they add it back in to kind of your income on the AMT side of the equation. It's not added into your regular taxation. And so what that can do is it can cause the AMT calculation to be much higher. And so um, if it ends up being much higher than your regular taxable income, you have to pay that higher tax. And so there's times where people will exercise their options. Let's say they were, you know, an early employee in their company and they have like a very low exercise price. Let's say it's like 10 cents or something. And then the current share price is $5. That's a huge difference. And if you have thousands of options and you just exercise them, you think you might be getting that clock ticking on that long-term capital gain tax treatment, like I mentioned, but you then inadvertently trigger that AMT tax and now you're owing tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands in AMT tax that you weren't planning for, but you have to come up with that money. And so you have to have that liquidity there. Um, now you can recoup that AMT tax. There's a tax credit you get, but it takes time to recoup that tax credit and it can take years. And so you're essentially uh, giving the IRS an interest-free loan. And it's just something that uh, you want to weigh the, the pros and cons with. Interesting. So if I understand this correctly, so when people exercise the options, they own the shares, but they don't immediately realize the gain, let's say. So they don't have cash on hand, but because they have this paper gain, they have to pay potentially this, this tax. That's that, correct. Okay. Yep. That's correct. But then you also mentioned that they could get a tax credit. Yeah, so basically the AMT tax is so that they, they created the AMT tax code as a way uh, to make sure that people weren't circumventing the tax code um, because there were, you know, I think it came out like the 70s or 80s. Basically, there were certain things that people were doing where they weren't being taxed on. So they added these things back in and said, if you do trigger this, you have to pay a tax. So even though you're paying this higher level of tax, you're still getting a credit that you can recoup over time. But the way you recoup it is if you have to have your regular taxable income be higher than your AMT tax. And then that difference there is how much you can recoup, but that can take time to recoup because there may not be a substantial difference mm -hmm. uh, if you continue to do things like exercise options. That's definitely a very um, helpful uh, learning experience for me because I don't think I've ever encountered it personally, but I kind of heard about it and that was a very helpful explanation. Can you talk about some of the other strategies you find helpful, especially for millennial people? Sure. I think the typical profile is like married with a certain maybe high income. What are yeah. other strategies that you share with them? 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I do tend to work with couples. And a lot of times what I see is number one, maybe they're, you know, newly married and they're working on transitioning to having, you know, joint ownership over either bank accounts or even their investment accounts. So I definitely encourage people to always focus on the household, right? So as as soon as you're married, you're married filing jointly. So your tax is a joint unit. So you want to make sure that you are considering the household's income and the household's, you know, overall tax efficiency. So some things that I see commonly is that people aren't taking full advantage of things like their tax deferred accounts. So things like their 401k plan at work, uh, health savings account, um, stock purchase plan. Those are some typical like low hanging fruit where maybe one person with their income couldn't afford to do these things. But when they think about the household's income, uh, let's say one person earns substantially more, you guys can, you can supplement each other and then it helps the overall household's tax situation. Um, you know, so for example, you just want to create a hierarchy of plan savings. Um, so thinking about, you know, uh, cash flow permitting, right? So after taxes, how much can you afford to save as a joint unit, right? It depends on what your long-term goals are. A lot of times clients I work with do kind of want to work towards achieving financial flexibility, maybe financial independence at a earlier age and so that requires saving a substantial amount of your income you know maybe 20 percent of your gross income and then where do you allocate that money so again um, things like maxing out your 401k you can each contribute twenty three thousand, you know for 2024 now you also have the decision do you go you know pre-tax traditional contributions or do you go roth you know uh, tax after tax contributions um, you know, these are questions that we work through. One of the things I like to educate clients on is it's not about um, minimizing taxes in any individual year. A lot of people get caught up in how do I minimize my taxes? You want to have a long term approach. It's about being lifetime tax efficient. And what that means is focusing on your effective tax rate. So your effective tax rate is actually what percentage of your income do you pay in taxes, right? You have your marginal rate, which is like, the rate at which you're being taxed for new income, but you, what you really pay is that overall effective rate. And so really what it what we look to do is if there are opportunities where maybe you're in a lower earning year is considering um, doing things like Roth 401k contributions, Roth IRA contributions, where we're putting money into that after-tax account and we're paying a lower effective tax rate. Or if you are a high earner and you're in that 35, 37% tax bracket, we're just going to focus on pre-tax contributions and doing that. Um, and then other things too, a lot of people want to take advantage of simple things like backdoor Roth IRA contributions. So if you are a higher earner and you're making over a certain amount, a lot of times people will say, oh, I, I make too much to contribute to a Roth IRA. Well, it's a pretty easy workaround. You can still contribute to a traditional IRA. Uh, it's just non-deductible because again, you exceed that income limit. And then you can do a Roth conversion. It's a simple form and you can convert that money to your Roth IRA. We call this a backdoor Roth IRA. The The only thing that you do need to be mindful of is that if you have existing pre-tax money in an IRA, then you, you are taxed on a uh, prorated amount of that conversion. So you don't typically want to do it if you already have existing pre-tax money in your IRA, which is another reason why you might want to keep pre-tax money in your 401k, but that's another rabbit hole to go down. So these are just kind of like little things that add efficiency to people's uh, income tax situation. Um, and that's usually the first thing I like to get people organized, uh, and focus on what is your hierarchy for plan savings? What is an appropriate cash reserve for you? What does your cash flow look like? Those are the basics. Well, there was a lot there. Sorry. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's okay. We can break it down. So for the listeners who might not be familiar with the different retirement accounts, can you explain the differences of what you mentioned? Roth IRA, IRA. Yeah, so a lot of people get confused with this. So let me just start with an IRA and a 401k. Okay, yeah. These are both retirement accounts. We call them retirement vehicles. Um, a 401k is always through your employer, although there are some other things you can do with a solo 401k, but usually through your employer. An IRA is just an individual retirement account. Anybody can open that. You can open that at any custodian you want. Um, and so those are the two main retirement vehicles that you'll encounter. Now, Within those two accounts, you typically have an option to do Roth contributions 
or traditional contributions. So the, the account is still an IRA or the account is still a 401k. But the traditional versus Roth, all that has to do with is the taxation of the money you're putting in. So typically with traditional contributions, for example, with a traditional 401k, any money you put in there, so again, you can, as an employee, contribute up to 23000 for 2024, that's going to reduce your income. So it's pre, we call it pre-tax. It's reducing your income. However, with the traditional 401k, later in life when you can access that money, which is typically after age 59 and a half, any money you distribute from that account, you're going to be taxed as income. So it's going to depend on your future effective tax rate, how much you pay in taxes in the future. And we don't know what tax rates are going to look like in the future. We, we also, it'll be dependent on what your overall asset and income situation looks like as well. So with Roth, when you contribute to a Roth 401k, for example, or a Roth IRA, you're not getting that income tax deduction. It's going in after tax. However, that money can then grow tax-free. And when you take it out after 59 and a half, unlike the traditional accounts, that money is distributed to you income tax free, which is really nice for flexibility and gives you a lot of uh, future planning opportunities. Gotcha. You said that there could be a backdoor Roth IRA, if I heard that correctly. Can you explain that a bit more? So you start with a traditional or vice versa, and then you convert it? Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to, it's not like it's a good thing to get in the habit of. I'm not going to say it's like the thing that's going to move the needle for you, but it's one of those things that higher earners should be in the habit of doing, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically, if you exceed the income limit to contribute directly to a Roth IRA, which I forget the exact limit, it's probably like 150000 roughly, um, you can still, anybody can contribute to a traditional IRA, okay? However, there is an income limit as well for the deductibility of that contribution, but anybody can contribute to it after tax, non-deductible. Okay, so you contribute that money, currently 7,000 for 2024. It goes into your um, traditional IRA, and then you just sign what's called a Roth conversion form. Anybody can do a Roth conversion. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, there's just some strategies there as well, but basically you just sign that, and then you convert it from your traditional IRA. Since it's already been taxed, it was non-deductible, it comes over tax-free to the Roth IRA, and that's considered a backdoor Roth IRA. If you just Google backdoor Roth IRA, there's tons of explanations out there. Mm -hmm. And there's no penalty or anything to do that, the conversion form? No, as long as it goes from retirement account to retirement account, so traditional IRA to Roth IRA, there's no penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no taxation. The, the only thing I mentioned earlier that you, you would want to be mindful of where there can be taxation is if you have existing pre-tax money in a traditional IRA, so let's say you had made contributions prior and and you were able to deduct that contribution, or you did something like a 401k rollover where you rolled over an old 401k and put that in your IRA. If there's existing pre-tax money, uh, there is what's called like a pro rata rule where you do have to pay tax on a percentage of the conversion. Um, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds a little bit trickier than than I thought, but I guess that's where financial advisors come in. <laughs> if you, it, it is a little trickier, but if you, most people shouldn't have free tax money in their traditional IRA unless they rolled over a 401k. Uh -huh. I shouldn't say most people, but yeah, it's, you can always roll that money though from your, if you have pre-tax money in your traditional IRA, you can actually roll that money into like your 401k mm -hmm. and then you're fine to do that back to a Roth contribution. Uh-huh, uh-huh because the 401k is considered a separate account type from the IRA. Um, so you can get around that. But yeah, you're right. This is a reason to consult a tax professional or advisor. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm just thinking about my personal situation and my husband's um, retirement accounts as well. I think both of us converted to an IRA after we left a previous employer. Is there yep. a difference between rolling it over to a 401k versus... IRA, is there advantage for either one? Like, yeah, what's the difference? Yeah, so there's there's a couple of re so a couple of things to consider when you're thinking about a 401k rollover. Um, usually, the reason people roll over from a 401k to an IRA is that they want to consolidate their accounts. They don't, you know, they're leaving their employer. They don't want to have an extra 401k over there. Um, there's a small difference. So uh, 401ks are technically protected, unlimited from liability events. So if you had like two million in a 401k, it would be protected. 
Uh, technically, IRAs are only protected up to a million. So if you are concerned about liability purposes, 401ks do provide more protection in that event, like if you were to get sued kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something to consider. Um, you know, typically 401ks have limited investment options where your IRA is going to have unlimited investment options usually. So that's a reason for the pro side of rolling over. Um, and then the big one that I would say as well is, yeah, if you are doing backdoor Roth contributions, then typically you want to, uh, if you can, keep it in the 401k because then you'll avoid that, that pro rata taxation that I mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Moving on to... Um, some of the other topics I saw on your website, you mentioned financial flexibility and financial independence quite a bit. Can you explain the concept of the two and how typically ha can a person achieve, you know, either financial flexibility or financial independence? No, it's a great question. And I've really gone more towards the flexibility side of things from the independence side of things, just because, um, well, I'll tell you why. So, Basically, you know, if you've heard of like financial independence, retire early, right? The FIRE mm -hmm. movement. Um, so basically, if you are completely financially independent, in my opinion, you know, you're able to cover your desired lifestyle from your investment assets, which is hard to do. I like to say, you know, to be a little safer about 30x your living expenses is what I, is a nice number if you're being strategic. So basically, if you spend $100,000 a year of living expenses, uh, you'd want to have like $3 million accessible in an investment portfolio. If you had $3 million accessible in like a, you know, non-retirement account, and you were strategic with your how you were managing withdrawals and how it was invested, in theory, you could um, extract that 100,000 and not run out of money over the course of your lifetime. Okay, barring like some crazy market drawdown. So a lot of people will try to live below their means substantially to try to achieve that 25x, 30x of their living expenses. You may have heard of the 4% rule, yeah. the rule of thumb where you can extract, four, you know, that's based on base. So the 4% rule is basically based on historical returns of a 60, 40 portfolio for 60% stock, 40% bond. And it was looking at a 60 year old, um, you know, over the retiring at age 60 and basically through any market environment, if they stuck to a 4% withdrawal, even looking at market crashes, you know, 2008 event, you know, dot com bubble, they didn't run out of money. So that's where the 4% rule of thumb comes into play. Now, that's pretty, you know, unattainable for a lot of people to save that level of, of assets unless you do have like a windfall from equity compensation, things like that. So I like to focus more on financial flexibility. And what that means is that, you know, really taking a longer view of your life and not being afraid to use your resources. So, you know, millennials are changing jobs a lot more frequently. Basically, everyone is either fire you or change your change jobs. And so financial flexibility is just basically, you know, creating good planning habits, building up your resources, understanding, again, all these all these personal finance fundamentals, and then not being afraid to use your resources. Like, again, if you want to take a sabbatical, or if you want to take a year off from work, or let's say you get laid off and you want to take the next six months off, you can use your resources and it's not going to impact your long-term, you know, probability of success. So it's financial flexibility is just basically about um, having a margin of safety by building up some assets and then actually using them, not waiting until this arbitrary, you know, 59 and a half, for example. Why do you think that millennials are almost obsessed with financial independence and financial flexibility, because I think the fire movement is pretty recent. Maybe there were some precedents, but those people weren't really advertising it, but I've seen so much talk about it, blogs, news, even there's a Netflix movie about it, I think, which I watched and it's pretty interesting. Uh, but like you said, it's pretty difficult to achieve. Um, but then, you know, I think there are still a lot of people who let's say religiously try to get there. Um, so why do you think that's the case? And, and why do you think it's important? Well, I think that, I think that millennials probably saw their parents, the baby boomers, you know, work a linear career at the same place, like 30 years at the same place and then just retire. And it was like, for what you met, you kind of used up a lot of your um, good, you know, healthy years when your health was better, you know, to basically, be able, you don't want to sacrifice your best years, um, you know, just to achieve retirement 
at a certain age. So I think the fire movement comes out of that and that, you know, they have a better sense of like, you know, see, again, seeing what maybe our parents' generation did and, and wanting to try a different path. And I think a lot of people are also, you know, not happy with their day-to-day -day job. And and I would say, I would push back, like if you're just trying to achieve financial independence because you don't like your job, uh, you, you can fix that a lot easier than trying to save up 30 times your living expenses. You can make a change, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think what happens too is a lot of people that even if they do achieve financial independence, I've worked with clients that have had, you know, substantial windfalls from, you know, company going private to public and they do have enough money to at least achieve some level of financial independence, but that gets boring. You, 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 they still want something to do. And it's more about, um, you know, financial independence work optional or, you know, doing things that you enjoy that maybe don't make as much money as like your chosen career. Um, so I think a lot of people, even if they do achieve it, decide that, you know, it's really not, you, you still have to figure out how you want to use your time. Sounds good. I also want to ask you about maybe on the investing side, do you advise your clients how to invest besides what they make either through salary or equity comp? The more important part, I think, is to keep that money and grow it. Right. So how do you advise them typically for their investing? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, yeah, so I do manage like money on, on a discretionary basis for clients. And, um, you know, I'm very much in the passive camp, you know, so like um, ETFs, you know, um, I'm a big believer in the Vanguard methodology, although it doesn't have to be Vanguard. Um, you know, I like the idea of owning the world stock market. So really owning the stock market as it's like comprised. So basically you have, uh, you're going to grow with the world's economy, world stock market. Now, the biggest thing, the biggest drivers of returns to me is how much you own in stocks, how much you own in bonds, and how much you own in cash. Those three things are going to determine a large portion of your return. Um, you know, so basically, m when I work with the client, we create an investment policy statement, which just kind of dictates like, hey, here are the rules by which we want to manage your investable assets. Here are the percentages that make sense given your investing time horizon. If you're not using your money, if you're not living off your assets, you can afford to take on much more risk. If you are living off your assets, then it, there is more planning involved as far as like, hey, maybe we want a buffer of X amount of years in either cash or you know short-term treasuries or whatever that looks like. And we create kind of a buffer between us and our stock portfolio. Um, so that's where the personalization comes into play. But when it comes to the actual investment selection, I'm very much a believer in um, owning you know, index type funds, whether, but via ETFs typically. And um, again, the reason is just that the historical evidence behind that is that by getting average returns where you're just capturing the growth of the stock market, you're going to outperform a majority of investors, including professional money managers on Wall Street. Investing is the one area where um, you don't have to, like, just doing average is going to be better than the majority of investors, which is a kind of a hard thing to understand. And a lot of people overcomplicate and actually underperform because they think there's some way to consistently outperform. Yeah. You mentioned that there's a lot of evidence that maybe suggests investing passively in an index fund is better um, than actively investing because it outperforms majority of professional money managers. I think that's probably what I hear most often too. Do you have sort of maybe strong conviction from, you know, a book or some gurus talking about it that you can recommend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've definitely, there's a lot of, so any Jack Bogle book. So if you're familiar with Jack Bogle, yeah. he passed away a few years ago, Vanguard uh, founder. Um, he had a few books, you know, Common Sense on Mutual Funds was one I read a long time ago where basically he just lays out all the statistics of if you look at the longer term track history uh, of mutual funds versus the index, um, there's also, they, they basically, again, a majority of them underperform. And there's also uh, even a survivorship bias where basically funds, a lot of funds just cease to exist. And that's not even included in the data. Um, a Random Walk Down Wall Street is a really good classic book that also highlights a lot of that same data. Um, I mean, if you just go to Vanguard and, dot com and, and read some of their white papers uh, on the data um there's all kinds of different resources that'll show you know the percentage of 
you know, active mutual funds that outperform their benchmark. Benchmark meaning that, you know, if you're a, uh, you know, U.S. large cap manager, meaning that you purchase large companies that are U.S. based, your benchmark might be the S&P 500, which is just the largest 500 companies, okay, weighted by how large they are. And what you'll see in the data is that um, basically, you know, a certain percentage may outperform in one year, but then that percentage drops off in three years, five years, 10 years, the longer in time frame you go out, uh, the more underperformance there is. And that's due to fees. Uh, it's due to taxes. Because the other thing too, is people don't think about returns after taxes. If you're trading a lot, um, you're going to owe short-term capital gains. That's going to reduce your after-tax return, but people don't always factor that in. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of other resources for you. Um, dimensional funds is also a different spin on that, but also has a lot of evidence-based stuff there if you go to their website. Um, but yeah, I would say Random Walk Down Wall Street, Common Sense on Mutual Funds, is some good like books that have stood the test of time. Yeah. Well, I like Simple Path to Wealth. That is also a good book that explains why investing in an index fund, S&P 500 and the like, is probably the simplest and um, could be better than most of the other sort of active funds. So I find that a very easy read and, you know, pretty convincing for, for the case that the author is trying to make. Just to throw that out. I haven't, I haven't read that one, but that sounds... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the FIRE community people pretty much think that that book is the Bible for the FIRE community, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But anyway, um, either on your website or LinkedIn profile, you mentioned that you have a maybe small amount of clients and you want to focus on these clients instead of branching out more broadly and maybe doing just like high level advising. Can you talk about that philosophy and how you're implementing it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a solo advisor. I do have some, you know, virtual assistants that I use, but basically I always want to have the one-on-one -on -one communication with clients. And, you know, the nice thing about this day and age is that there's the technology where, uh, I really don't think there is like anything that a big corporation can have that the independent advisor can't have. Um, so I think that's all kind of a, a lot of it's, you know, smoke and mirrors when it comes to like the resources that the big firms have. And so, you know, for me, uh, I'm not, I was never looking to build like a massive company. And so, um, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, you can really only effectively manage a certain amount of relationships. I mean, for me, I put that number at 50, um, it could be a little bit more than that. I mean, some advisors are a hundred, but you know, it just allows me to make sure that I have quality control across the planning relationships and also that I have some free time in my life. I, I like I said, I'm not here to build an empire. I like to enjoy myself outside of work. So it was just about being intentional and creating a practice that uh, they call it a lifestyle practice, I guess, um, yeah. that sense. suits me and my clients. Yeah. How do you usually, um, obtain these clients? Is it through word of mouth advertising? Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's all different types of ways. I mean, there's a lot of like online directories for like, you know, um, you know, feel and uh, napfa.com and then basic SEO. So just like search engine optimization. So basically, my website is my storefront. And the whole goal of my website is if somebody is the right fit, you know, hopefully I've done a good job of explaining who I do my best work for is to get them to schedule that introductory, you know, call uh, or meeting. And so, um, you know, I've done it through a lot of content marketing. I have my own podcast as well. Um, so I would say primarily through content marketing, um, basic SEO, and then referrals. Gotcha. And yeah. how many clients do you currently have, if you don't mind sharing? That. Yeah, I'm working with like 35 households, okay. like 50 something individuals. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. What's your future plan? So you mentioned that you don't necessarily want to grow it too big, but um, what's your sort of ideal, let's say, level of um, the size of your company or amount of clients that you want to achieve? Yeah, I would say like right now I have the capacity to go up to maybe six, 60 households given my current arrangement. If I wanted to go beyond that, I'd have to look at hiring additional people. So, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. I don't anticipate going beyond that. Like I said, I, I really would just, I, li I like the craft of financial planning if that's, mm -hmm. if, you know. So I really just enjoy that. I like working with people that I enjoy working with. 
and and that's really the end vision for now. Um, I think that um, you know maybe there there would be another type of business that I would give my give a stab at, and um, that's a little bit more scalable. That doesn't require my one on one time. Um, but for now, you know my my vision is just kind of getting to capacity with with modern wealth builders and um, yeah, continuing to serve the people that have entrusted me. Okay, great. Two last questions for you. Do you have any book recommendations for people who want to learn about financial planning, personal finance, that kind of topics? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many. Let me just go to my Kindle real quick. But I would say, if you're looking for help specifically with equity compensation,、uh, if you do have stock options, consider your options is a really good like, you know, for a complicated subject, it is a、uh, very good.、Um, Read. I'm trying to think of, you know, just on a side note, I really like、uh, the Almanac and Naval Ravikant in general.、Oh. Um, it's actually a free book online.、Uh, if you're familiar with Naval, he's on Twitter.、Um, it's a guide to building wealth and happiness. So the first half of the book is on building wealth, and the second half is on building happiness. And、um, he, you know, he believes they're both skills that, that can be learned. It's not necessarily financial planning focus, but if you are looking to, you know, build wealth from the standpoint of like building a company, it's a really good read in that regard.、Uh, if you're just talking financial planning, I mean, Kitsis.com. I mean, it's going to be more geared towards, you know, industry industry professionals. But if you're actually wanting to learn about like the technical aspects of financial planning, that's going to be your best resource, better than even any any book necessarily.、Um, that's the Michael Keats website. Yes. Yes. So it just k i t c s dot com, kitsis dot com, and they have so many blog posts on pretty much anything financial planning related.、Um, those are the first that come to mind. Yeah. I've kind of got away a little bit from the financial planning investing books just because, like, I've done so much of it over the years that I've been more on kind of the marketing and sales and、uh, right, right. self help kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then, last question: Where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so modernwealthbuilders.com is my website. You can learn everything there. I'm, I'm on Twitter, TJ at TJ Van Gerven, but my website has everything as well. So that would be it. And then, do do more with your money podcast available wherever you stream、um, is also my my main spot. So, all right, great. Well, this has been really helpful. Thank you so much, TJ, for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. 